right, here we go. Pinker book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, a history of violence and an attempt to understand the darker side of humanity. The man who is the focus of today's show plays an almost starring role among the many of the other tyrants, criminals, and government-sanctioned sadists. He's sometimes called the worst mass murderer in the history of tyrants, but no- So they're using a book by Steven Pinker. I want to look up who that is. That's their justification for- or that's their- I don't- he's a Canadian psychologist, so a Western academic who doesn't have his background in history. So this is what happens a lot, um, or like the way that, that leaders in, in countries, the U.S. or the Western world doesn't like are portrayed is often by like analyzing their psychology. So um, in, in the U.S., Adorno, um, who was a famous Marxist thinker actually, came up with this theory that there's an authoritarian personality um, and, and that certain, certain personalities um, are more, more uh, susceptible to fall for like uh, demagoguery, like, uh, um, like authoritarian leaders, um, which, you know, authoritarian is a word that doesn't mean that much anymore in, in and of itself. So, you know, there, there you can see how, like, how do you, how do you label someone as an authoritarian person? It doesn't really make much sense, but, um, by having these psychology and cognitive science people analyze the, the personalities and the psychologies of great leaders, you know, you can, you can ignore class analysis, you can ignore analysis of the productive forces, you can ignore historical context, and you can just hyper focus on the personalities of like Mao or, or whoever else, you know, and uh, this is like what most of the Western scholarship on World War II is. It's like an obsession with the, the authoritarian personality of Hitler, um, whereas Michael Parenti's Black Shirts and Reds is more of like a class analysis of what happened in the, in the different class forces at the time um, and the different historical events and, and the historical context that led to the rise of Hitler, you know, rather than just focusing on his psychology and how was he able to convince people he was this good guy, you know. Um, Obviously, the, the psychology of these leaders plays a role, but it's a minuscule role compared to, compared to um, the history of their countries and, and the, the context of the revolutionary struggle they engage in, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, I don't know much about this Steven Pinker guy, but I'm, sh yeah, I'm not surprised that he is a psychologist, and they're citing a psychologist rather than a historian um, when talking about Mao and these other authoritarian leaders who happen to be everyone that the U.S. wants to overthrow. Um... <laughs> Normally, you're very loud and clear, but today I can't hear you that well. Hmm, that's not good. That is not good at all. Here, I'll turn up my gain a little. Let me know if it's better now. I'm at work in a loud environment. Oh, got you. That stinks. Sorry about that. Okay, let's continue watching this Venezuela video. Please tell me, I mean, sorry, this China video. Please tell me if... Uh, anything's off with the audio. Knowing the exact number of how many died due to his policies and those just murdered under the regime is not easy. That number is sometimes said to be about 40 million. Sometimes regime is not easy. That number is sometimes said to be about 40 million. Sometimes we're told 45 million. Do you, I mean, this should be revealing because, I mean, when you grow up, you kind of have this like trust for authority, and, like a trust that like history teachers or history channels aren't lying to you. But, like, now that, you know, most of the people watching the stream are probably, like, more skeptical of the media um, and more skeptical of the information, does, does nobody think it's weird that they don't even know, that they just guesstimate? So what this is, is the 45 million number came from China Quarterly. Um, it was a number attributed to the Great Leap Forward. So after the Great Leap Forward, um, there, was this o there was always this debate in the party going on at the time as to whether they should have more economic planning, whether they should have a more, you know, top-down model where... Uh, inputs and outputs in production, um, including labor and raw materials, are more controlled by the uh, centralized authority um, of the state. And then there was uh, more people who wanted to go forward with like Lenin's NEP, New Economic Policy, which would allow for a lot more market exchange um, and a lot more free exchange among firms, less centralized control. Um, and, the, and the centralized control model was m closer to uh, what, was, what was done under Stalin in the USSR. Um, so they went, they ended up going ahead with Mao's, you know, more Stalinist approach, more top-down planning, and, and, you know, it, it industrialized the country, it industrialized agriculture, it increased the standard of living um, uh, greatly, it increased the average life expectancy of, uh, um, of Chinese civilians by like 15 years, 
um, before Mao was done. Uh, but Deng Xiaoping, who was on the side of the, the more market um, NEP style uh, strategy, said that if they had gone ahead with his plan, um, the more Leninist model rather than the Stalinist model, the Great Leap Forward would have been better. Um, and, and some of the hardships of the Great Leap Forward could have been avoided. Um, and Deng Xiaoping was the one who first put out the, the 16 million number of people who died in this uh, anti-Mao campaign within China um, to try and raise his own status in, in the party, which obviously worked. Deng Xiaoping would go on to be the next leader of China after Mao. Um, but the number he said was 16 million. Um, so this, this CIA-funded outlet called China Quarterly um, – Ex used data and extrapolated from data to find the 45 million number and then of course like the black book of communism and other books have just extrapolated from there um, and, and got it as high as they possibly could this death count um, but uh, it originally came from china quarterly the 45 million number and, and the editor of china quarterly um and china quarterly was being funneled money by the cia um, but the, the lead editor, the owner of it, said that he was unaware that the money was coming from the CIA. So it couldn't have possibly influenced him in coming up with these death numbers. Um, so I don't know if you believe that China Quarterly didn't actually know that they were being funded by the CIA and, and you think they came to these numbers. Honestly, I don't know. I think you're a little bit naive. I'm more skeptical of CIA funded news outlets in the West uh, talking about communist leaders. Um, but yeah. And sometimes we're told even as many as 65 million. It's hard to even imagine such a thing. And we might be reminded of the phrase sometimes attributed to, there are doubters, the tyrants. Look at this. Lenin, Stalin, and Mao. So I'm assuming what they're going to talk about right now is the debate that was going on within the party. Right? Because Deng Xiaoping and others wanted a, a closer to a Leninist model, but Mao um, and, and others wanted more of a Stalinist model. So I'm sure they're going to discuss the, the productive system of China in depth. And they're definitely not going to portray all these people as uh, scary comic book villains who killed puppies for fun. Joseph Stalin. A single death is a tragedy. A million deaths is a statistic. The reason the number of... Do you know what that... They just said a quote that made Stalin look good. Do you know what that means? It means that if you, you know, if, if you explain the death of someone, right? If you, or if, like, say... Um, like if you have a bunch of media outlets who are focusing on one tragic story of one person who died, it pulls at your heartstrings, right? And you think, oh, this is so terrible, right? If you were to, to look at Palestine right now and hear the stories of individual children, um, like the children who were in their homes seeking trauma care from the last time Israel launched missiles at them, who then were killed um, while they were getting trauma care by missiles, um, as they're seeking trauma care for the last time they were hit by missiles. We hear these stories, and they pull at our heartstrings. They're like, um, we're like, this is disgusting. This is a tragedy. Um, but when millions of people die, you know, we think of it as a, as a statistic, right? Oh, millions, right? We don't, it doesn't pull at your heart, heartstrings the same way. It's just a, uh, it's just a stat. Um, and, and just looking at things statistically, you know, can make people a little more callous. Um, whereas individual stories and individual narratives about lives can be used to uh, pull at people's heartstrings and stuff. Um, it's actually a really good quote. Um, it makes a lot of sense if you if you actually think about it, not just think of Stalin as like someone who who killed millions of people for fun. Yes, changes, of course, is because getting access to records, if there is even a record of death, it's not easy. And it's also difficult to know who died as a direct result of Mao's policies and zero tolerance attitude to critics. But historians haven't pulled it. OK, that was good. They said it's hard to know how many people died during the time uh, directly due to Mao's policies. It is. Um, even even in China, they don't know that that 16 million number was from Deng Xiaoping, and that's been you know doubled and tripled by by U.S. academics. Um, and he says Mao's policy of no criticism. Mao published cri uh, harsh harsh criticism of his own um, uh, policies in the in the Great Leap Forward and, and in the entire process of agricultural uh, collectivization. And he encouraged uh, critique. And as I was saying, there was this great debate in the party as to what to do at the time. You know, and after the era of Mao, Deng Xiaoping said, you know, Mao's policies were worse. Mine were better. He was heavily critical of Mao's policies. So um, this this idea that we can't find the exact death number is definitely true. But this idea that Mao and the, the party um, had a policy of no criticism is absolutely ridiculous, especially, you know, uh, uh, considering the level of criticism, the incredibly high level of criticism they have um, compared to uh, Western democracies like the U.S. Um, uh, within their government, where, where basically, you know, in the West, um, our politicians like Nancy Pelosi think they're God's gift to, to us, right? These people, they're... Um, 
they're elitist. Uh, whereas the party of China is, is heavily, heavily critical um, and, and encourage criticism by the people, especially during this time. Right. They still do today, but especially when they were just starting out um, and they didn't necessarily and they had to build their country um, from like a backwards feudal uh, formerly colonized nation um, into into a nation that could take care of um, one billion people. The number out of hats and there are ample well-researched accounts of the devastation of Mao's policies and also how his regime was sometimes incredibly cruel toward the Chinese people, especially dissidents. The historian Frank de Cotter, who spent a lot of time researching in archives for what went down during the Great Leap Forward, said Mao Zedong was responsible for one of the worst catastrophes the world has ever known. He said around 45 million people either starved or were worked to death or were beaten to death. It ranked so he, this person said 45 million. I'm assuming this is the, the China Quarterly historian um, who is getting all that CIA money who said that he forgot. Um, you can, you can, there's a really good monthly, uh, I'll pull it up here, monthly review, Great Leap Forward. I cite this a lot in my uh, recent video about China, and we talk about the Great Leap Forward a lot. But if you want just like a breakdown of, of how um, Western historians like this guy came to all these ridiculous numbers. Uh, here you see that official Chinese sources released after Mao's death suggest 16.5 million people, right? And then these Western historians increase that to 45 million people. And the collectivization of agriculture um, uh, and, and these industrial industrialization policies massively increased the standard of living, massively increased life expectancy, you know, and, and the famine was, was mostly caused by horrible weather conditions. Um, and of course there were famines, tons of famines, you know, before Mao um, and, and after the industrialization and collectivization of agriculture and, and the increasing of China's productive forces, there haven't been famines. Uh, but that doesn't mean, of course, that this wasn't an actual tragedy that happened in China. And, it, and of course it happened partly because of uh, collectivization, right? But um, uh, it's not like uh, the fam it's not like a famine wouldn't have happened uh, if China had remained a semi-feudal country and not had a communist revolution. It just wouldn't have been covered in the West. You know, nobody would have uh, uh, the West wouldn't blow it up as the greatest famine ever. You never hear um, uh, they never teach you in the West about famines that happened before 1949 in China, right? All the famines that happened or all the, the brutal tyranny of the landlords who ran the country before the, the communist party overthrew them. Um, Never talk about that because you're not allowed to talk about things as a historical development. You have to look at them in isolation because we live in uh, liberal America. Some of us do, not all of us Thanks alongside the gulags and the Holocaust as one of the three greatest events of the 20th century. The gulags and the the gulags. <laughs> so the great leap forward, the gulags and the Holocaust were the worst events of the 20th century. There were less people in the gulags than there are today in the American prison system. By a lot, so so by your by your count there by um, this estimation that means that in the 21st century, uh, the American prison system has surpassed all of the greatest horrors of the 20th century, including the Holocaust, which is you know ridiculous. Obviously, it's it's weird to compare the American prison system to the greatest horrors of the 20th century, but you know if you're if you're gonna make this claim that the gulags um, were as bad as the Holocaust. Uh, um, then, you know, logically, then, then the U.S. prison system is too. Uh, but, of course, that's not true. The gulags were not as bad as the Holocaust, um, and the Great Leap Forward was not an intentional killing of people the same way that the Holocaust was. Um, all right. It was Pol Pot's genocide multiplied 20 times over, he said. We can tell you firsthand. Can you turn your mic up, someone says? I can try. People had me turn my... How's that? Is that any better? Is it the speakers or just my mic? Um, let me know if that's any better. I, I tried to turn up, um, I tried to turn up the decibels. Vid is also crazy loud, maybe. Okay. Well, I will turn the video down then, too. Good idea. All right. Uh, let me know how this is. I'm going to check the chat after we watch this next section of video, and y'all can tell me how the audio is. And how this writer told a captivated audience at a literary festival that people were only seen as digits, things to move the Great Leap ahead. This historian, while researching his book, Mao's Great Famine, the story of China's most devastating catastrophe, explains to people that while looking through China's Public Security Bureau reports, he found some things that turned his blood cold. Decoder said that in these records of the provinces, he found that there were instances of children, hungry children, stealing potatoes. The rulers were strict about crime, and in one instance, the child had his hands tied and was thrown into a river. Others were forced to work naked in winter as a punishment, and some were branded others said so this is what stalin means 
when he says that um, uh, uh, one death is like a tragedy, um, but a bunch of deaths is a statistic. So, you know, rather than talking about what the Great Leap Forward actually was, you know, rather than discussing the need to industrialize, um, rather than discussing the need to uh, start making steel and, and the policy of using the agricultural surplus um, to help build up the cities and, and build up industrialization in the towns um, and in the factories, rather than talk about that, right, they just extract, they just uh, tell this one story, you know, like, oh, the Chinese people, um, this country that's now uh, 1.4 billion people, but however many people it was back then, close to a billion people, um, at one point, you know, there was a child thrown in the river with his hands tied together. So that's why, you know, China is evil. And that's why they their economic policies were, were horrible and Mao purposefully killed people um, by using this one story, which may or may not be true and which has really nothing to do with Mao. Um, you can you can portray um, the entire the entire movement in China, the entire Communist Party of China um, as this uh you know, this comic book uh, villainous type group who, who throws babies in the water for trying to eat, right? When in reality, um, there were mass famines, mass starvation before the revolution. Uh, this, uh, the Great Leap Forward and other collectivization policies increased life expectancy by 15 years. Um, and, and the Western countries were, were purposefully getting the Chinese people addicted to opium. Um, the Japanese people uh, had invaded them and um, uh, had a sort of brutal occupation. Um, and, and the country was run by, by brutal feudal landlords, right? It was a semi-feudal country where giant, um, giant landlords basically reigned with terror. Um, and there was a, a revolution to overthrow that. Uh, but then the West looks at that and says, yeah, but that revolution, um, there's a story about them throwing a baby in a river. So therefore disregard everything. Like this is not history, right? This is one, uh, one story the, that may or may not be true that's, that's meant to provoke emotions, right? That's meant to make you feel anger and hatred towards China and meant to make you see them as some kind of other, some kind of country who, who has so little empathy um, because of communism that they throw babies in the river. Um, when, you know, this is, this would be ridiculous in like, uh, and if you were like presenting, presenting this as the history of the Great Leap Forward, right? Because it's not even talking about the history of the Great Leap Forward. It's not even talking about what they were trying to do. It's not even talking about the economic policies. It's just talking about how the guards like apparently threw 16 million babies in the river on fire, while others merely had their nose or ears cut off. Perhaps the most disturbing thing was a record of parents being forced by officials to bury their children alive. But starvation killed... Have you ever wondered what would happen... So this is what I'm talking about, you know? They just are citing one Western historian um, who has all these different narratives about, about people um, who died, whereas, you know, where, where are the, the critiques of the feudal landlords that existed before Mao? Or when you're talking about Mao, on, you know, if you're, if you're going to bring up these tragedies, you know... Um, I don't, I don't know how, how true all these stories are. They, they seem like some of them are definitely lies. Um, but if you're going to talk about Mao, you at least have to mention what they had before, right? Like, why did Mao come to power? Why was there a revolution? It was because there were brutal tyrants who were running the country. Um, and then after that, they industrialized, uh, massively increased the amounts that they could produce and, and massively increased the life expectancy and standard of living for everybody in China. Um, but rather than that, they're just going to list off story after story um, of different human rights abuses that went on, which, again, they started this this video with Stalin's quote, like, uh, one death is a tragedy, but a million deaths is a st statistic. Um, this is exactly what I was saying. The U.S. media, um, corporate media can take individual tragedies to try and portray an entire country as evil. Most people. To give you an example, Dakota writes that in one town containing around 250,000 people, 80% of the folks were deliberately kept away from the official canteens where the food was served. They were old or weak, and so it was decided that they were a waste of space in the greater scheme of things and should be starved to death. That's how bad it was. And this information was taken from archives, not word of mouth. But before we talk about more misery, let's look at who this leader... This was taken from archives, not word of mouth. We will cite none of the archives. We will only cite China Quarterly, the CIA-funded magazine. We will not cite any sources inside China like Deng Xiaoping, who, uh, who was the person who first um, drew attention to the, the deaths under famine that happened in China. Insane was. This will be a very abridged history as people have written long books on this man's life. Little Mao was born on December 26, 1893 in a small rural community called Shaoshan in the province of Hunan, China. His parents were farmers and were said to have worked hard in the fields of that town for generations. They were farmers. They were peasants. Farmers are people who own land. The farmers at the time 
you know, and there weren't a lot of them. Mostly it was just giant feudal landlords, but there were also farmers who just owned land and had a bunch of poor peasants work their land. I don't, I don't actually know Mao's history. Maybe that's what his, his parents actually were. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, it was a peasant society. Almost everybody worked um, in, in agrarian rural regions. They didn't industrialize and start building cities and factories until the industrialization um, policies of Mao. And then later, you know, that would, of course, grow with uh, the art opening up and market reforms of Deng Xiaoping. It said his family weren't that bad off for their area, which was mostly made up of very poor peasants. He did a bit of schooling, but by the time he was 13, he was working in the fields too. It said he'd been a good student and enjoyed reading and writing poetry. It said that he was asked to leave school for being unruly, according to an excerpt from a book featured in the New York Times. His mother, whom he had worshipped, was okay with him leaving, but his father was displeased, according to this book. Mao himself once said he had bitter fights with his father. At 14, his dad said he found a wife for Mao, but we're told he turned the offer down. Other sources tell us he did in fact marry her, but that Mao never later recognized her as his proper wife. In his own words, Mao once said, When I was 14, my parents married me to a girl of 20, but I never lived with her. I do not consider her my wife, and I've given little thought to her. She died a year after the marriage anyway, and it said... So this is this shows, like, the culture that China had based on, like, their semi-feudal country. So this is, you know, imagine China today, one of the largest economic powers in the world, and, you know, you can hate on what they do or not, but they were a semi-feudal country with a culture where the, the parents were just marrying off their kids. Right. And they were they were working their kids in the fields at the age of, of 13, while the kids were also trying to go to school. Um, this is something that doesn't happen in industrialized countries. Right. Obviously, they try and get child labor, especially like the fast food industry. Um, but uh, in industrialized countries where we have uh, um, a large uh, level of productive forces, um, kids generally don't have to work in the fields all day to make sure that the family doesn't starve while also trying to go to school. But this was the reality in China um, before the revolution and before the construction that happened uh, uh, after, after the, uh, the party came to power. Even though his father wanted him to work in a rice store, Mao had his sights set on studying in a modern school where he could learn things like foreign languages, science, and world history. He would soon be inspired by Western economists, philosophers, military leaders, and scientists, as well as the writings of philosopher and economist Karl Marx. It's said that around this time, still a young man, he developed a reasoning that the end justifies the means. Or perhaps you might say that to make an omelet, you have to break some eggs. His True. <laughs> True. Because the state... Um, the government is is a, uh, a necessity of class society, and it is a tool that has a monopoly on violence, and it has armed bodies which are used for the suppression of one class by another. So if Mao, um, reading people like Karl Marx and Lenin, uh, while growing up in feudal China where these tyrannical landlords are running the country, he realized that if we are going to uh, develop our country and that if we are going to be free from imperialism and foreign domination and if we are going to allow, you know, increase our productive forces so uh, children can go to school rather than working in the fields all day, we're going to need to uh, have a revolution and we're going to need to overthrow these landlords and, you know, we're going to need to do it by arming ourselves. They're not just going to hand us over the land. You know, it needs to be taken from these people who, who were wasting the land, using it ineffectively, um, uh, production outputs were very low, and and they were hoarding all the wealth, obviously, and ruling as, as tyrannical rulers. So to take out these, these tyrannical landlords who were running, uh, ruling the country with an iron fist, you do need to break some eggs to make that omelet. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, Marxism. And that's just, that's just looking at history realistically and realizing that revolutions are inevitable and they are something that happens when there's mass discontent um, between uh, conflicting classes. Uh, so... So, yeah, and, and I mean, when you talk about Cuba and China, it's like all this attention gets drawn to in Cuba, Che and Fidel, or in China, Mao. It's like they led entire armies just by, like, going to the peasants and saying, hey, let's have a revolution, right? Like, it wasn't like uh, they could have done this by themselves. Um, it was the peasants, the people who were brutally exploited, the children who were working in the fields all day, and the parents who were, you know, watching their kids work in the field all day. And, you know, they were a country that was uh, subject to foreign domination. So Mao came along and, you know, uh, said, let's let's overthrow the feudal landlords, do land redistribution, and, and build a, a system um, that allows us to take care of all the people of our country rather than uh stay with this system where feudal landlords dominate the the mass of society 
Um, so then the peasants heard that, and they're like, yeah. And the peasants joined the Revolutionary Army, and that's why the Revolutionary Army won um, in, in China. And, and I don't know how many people they started with in China, but in Cuba, they started the revolution with, like, 27 people. And, like, a bunch of them died when they first landed, so they had, like, 12 people. But the 12 people just went around to the peasants and said, hey, here, we're going to arm you and fight a revolution. And the peasants were so uh, exploited and, and so downtrodden that they were like, heck, yeah. So, you know, that's, that's a... a Rather, but, you know, of course, in the liberal West, in, in liberal history, you don't look at class forces, right? You don't look at, at uh, the peasant class um, and what they thought of the system before versus why they chose to have a revolution and, and move towards this new system. It's all just about Mao, right? It was just Mao reading Karl Marx, and he was so evil that he went around and, and somehow uh, took over the country. He went from being a farmer to taking over the country by himself. Like, he wouldn't have been able to do any of this if it wasn't for the, the revolutionary nature of the, the Chinese peasantry. His father at this time thought Mao's intellectual pursuits were totally pointless. Their breakup was imminent. At age 17, he left home and went to study in another city. After educating himself more, he went on to join the Revolutionary Army and the Nationalist Party, Kuomintang, whose intention was to overthrow the monarchy. That happened in 1912, and the Republic of China was born. These were exciting times for Mao, no doubt, but he didn't exactly rock it into politics. Introducing Lego, the online university library. Get unlimited access. Politics. In 1918, he became qualified as a teacher, but after looking for jobs in Beijing, he was still unemployed. Instead, he managed to land a job as a librarian's assistant at Beijing University. Around this time, we were told that Mao had taken an interest in Russia and what was going on there with the revolution in 1917, an uprising that would lead to the formation of the Soviet Union based on the tenets of communism. Just a couple of years later, and Mao would become one of the first members of the Chinese Communist Party. There was still a ruling nationalist party in China that Mao had supported from the beginning, but having watched Vladimir Lenin's ideas come to fruition not too far away, Mao believed it was time for for China to give some power back to the people. The True. Yes, Mao was heavily inspired by Lenin. This is one of the one of the main points that I made in a recent video about Mao, and and primarily uh, uh, inspired. Well, he was inspired by the goal of building communism, right? Mao was a, a truly devoted communist, but. Um, it was the anti-imperialist nature of Russia's revolution, right? Um, after the Russian Revolution, um, the the White Army, the Russian bourgeoisie, with the backing of the Western Allied powers like the U.S. and, and Great Britain, descended on the USSR and tried to overthrow the workers' state. Um, but but Lenin was was writing these theories and doing these things in the USSR, like the NEP, industrializing um, um, Russia and the Soviet Union, uh, increasing their productive forces while making one of their main goals to be free from foreign domination and free from imperialism, um, while backing different movements around the world attempting to do the same thing. Um, so that, that Leninist theory of anti-imperialism and, and increasing the productive forces and the overthrow of the state um, and its replacement with a worker state that Lenin describes in State and Revolution, um, was hugely inspirational for Mao um, and, and was part of why he became a communist. Same with, uh, with Ho Chi Minh. When he read Lenin, he said, like, the sun came out in the sky and he had never read anything like it before. Um, it was, uh, these are countries, you know, who had faced imperialism and imperialist aggression from capitalist powers for years. Um, and Lenin's theories of imperialism and the USSR's success in, in implementing a worker state um, and increasing their productive forces while freeing themselves from Western domination um, was hugely inspirational to... Uh, the Vietnamese communists and the Chinese communists. Agrarian masses that made up most of the country. What happened next, in short, is that the Chinese Nationalist Party broke off all alliances with the upstarts, the Communist Party. And here's where Mao stepped in. He led an army, the Red Army, of peasants against the nationalists. This violent reprisal wasn't without its reasons, of course. The nationalists had killed and locked up many people affiliated with the Communist Party before. They'd never talk about economics, right? It's always like, it's always hyper-focused on the political. It's like Mao, you know, overthrew people, uh, they're going to say Mao overthrew the, the nationalists, the Kuomintang, with, uh, um, with the peasants because of mean things that the Kuomintang did, right? Because the, the nationalists were brutal. It's like also the country was run, like I said, by like feudal landlords. Like it was a semi-feudal country where everybody was like an oppressed and brutally exploited peasant. Um, so they wanted to go ahead with a policy that developed their country and made it so people weren't starving um, and, and toiling away in the fields all day for nothing, you know, for the enrichment of tyrannical feudal landlords. So I'm sure they're going to talk about repression that happened under the Kuomintang, but it's always, it's just going to be individual acts of political repression, right? It's going to be like, oh, they killed these peasants, and that's why the peasants overthrew them. It's like, no, 
all of the peasants were being exploited, right? The system was based on the exploitation of the peasants, the semi-feudal system, the same way capitalism is based on the exploitation of the working class. So when Mao said, peasants, let's overthrow the landlords and redistribute their land to the people who actually work, the peasants were on board with it, right? It had, le you know, and it did have something to do with how tyrannical the feudal landlords are, but like, I mean... Uh, the the tyranny was just to keep people in their in their position of economic domination, right? For the fighting, Mao then formed the Soviet Republic of China, and by 1934, ten provinces in the country were under his communist control. Government forces then buckled down and tried to defeat all those mostly peasant guerrillas. Oh shoot! Guerrillas, but the communists retreated and began what was called the Long March, basically a hard trek through the mountains. It said from about 100,000 people that started the march, around 10 to 30,000 people died on the way. The exact. I guess they actually are talking about deaths caused under the feudal landlords, but like I said, this was a death in the war, you know, which is fine to talk, or these were deaths in the war, which is fine to talk about. But they didn't talk about deaths due to starvation and all the land that was being wasted by the feudal landlords and all the all the resources that were being hoarded by them um, and how much China's productivity increased after land was redistributed. Um, but yeah, the Long March was brutal. Um, and uh, Deng Xiaoping and Mao were both a part of this. They were both veterans of the Long March, which, you know, people love to separate Deng Xiaoping and Mao. They'll say, you know, Deng Xiaoping was a liberal, a capitalist, and Mao was a communist. Like, no, not at all. <laughs> they were both uh, both communists. They had different positions on, on um, what China should do. Uh, sh uh, Deng Xiaoping obviously was more for market reforms and, and you know, using uh, some of the forces of global capitalism to help construct socialism, whereas Mao was more about planning, you know, but they both fought in the Revolutionary War. They were both revolutionaries with the goal of constructing communism, and they were both veterans of this long march where thousands of people died. That number is disputed. Walking 8,000 miles over treacherous territory gave Mao some stories to tell. He was, in some ways, a great action and intellectual hero, and this would later fuel the cult of personality. If you don't know what that is, it's when a leader becomes somewhat of a demigod, and he and his cronies, often paranoid themselves of being accused of not being devout, used propaganda, the media, posters, unrealistic stories to promote this veritable savior. Look no further than North Korea for a present example. Matters become worse in China in 1937, when the Japanese Imperial Army invaded the country. The government couldn't have internal discord and and also fight Japan. The Red Army of Mao grew in size in part because you have to look uh, look to North Korea to see a crazy country where they uh, where they worship their leaders, right? You have to you have to go to those those crazy countries over in Asia where you find people who worship their their political leaders. We definitely don't do that in the United States. There's definitely like every you know. Everybody likes to have heroes. I'm not, you know, I know as communists, you don't want hero worship, which is why Mao encouraged so much criticism of himself and why there was so much debate within the party um, and criticism of each other because you don't want to have a cult of personality. Or, I mean, cult of personality can be okay, but you don't want, um, uh, you want the construction of socialism to be first, right? Not um, uh, this person's personality. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. But, you know, they say, they say that these countries worship their leaders, right? Because they put them on statues or like Kim Jong-un, you know, um, uh, there's statues of him and, and people have, have pictures of him hanging up, you know, and that is definitely a real cult of personality. Um, but like, it's the same thing. Look, we have the same statues of our leaders here in the U.S. that they have in China. The only difference is Mao's China redistributed land to the peasants after taking it from the feudal landlords and, and freed the slaves in Tibet. Whereas, you know, some of these people own slaves. Obviously, Abe Lincoln fought the war to get rid of them, but, but Jefferson and Washington um, were both in the time of slavery. And the industrialization policies of Mao that happened in the Great Leap Forward that they're criticizing him for, industrialization in the U.S. happened on the backs of slaves, right? If it wasn't for uh, slavery, the U.S. would not have been able to industrialize um, so quickly the way they did. Um, so, yeah, just the, the Western hypocrisy is always incredible. Because of the atrocities of the Japanese, Mao's communists were asked to get on one side, and they did. And together, along with help from the Allied forces, the Japanese were defeated. Did someone say that monument of young Mao is beautiful? It is. It is, uh, I, it's in Changshu, China, right? Is that the name of it? I can't remember the, the name of the actual, uh, the actual place it's in. But I was looking at it on Google Earth. It's like in this really really cool city um and there's like a river that goes through the city and in the river there's like a big long strip of land kind of like an island and they have this statue of mao carved into stone it's freaking cool <laughs>
needed. Where did this leave Mao? Well, in a pretty strong position. He wanted all of China, and that he got in the end. A second civil war ensued, and that ended with Mao's enemies skipping off to Taiwan. So now we have Mao the leader, and he did a lot of good things. If people got in his way, blood was often spilled, but he took land from warlords and gave it back to the people. He tried to stop opium production and cut down on addiction. He doubled the number of Chinese people getting a cut down on addiction. Yeah, just leave out the part about the opium wars. Leave out the part about British colonialism. Let's totally ignore that that was a thing and ignore that the British purposefully got the Chinese people addicted to opium so that they would be easier to exploit. Very similar to today's Afghanistan where the, the people of Afghanistan work in the opium fields often in exchange for like green cards and they're like chew opium, like, uh, like chewing tobacco because there's so much growing everywhere. Obviously, it's really easy to get addicted to it. But in China, the British during the opium wars purposefully got the Chinese people addicted to opium. Um, here, the opium war still, still shaped China's view of the West. So this was, right, this was not, you know, that the Chinese people were just all addicted to opium by accident. It was because of colonization and because of the, the, um, because capitalism loves addiction or, you know, addiction helps create profit. Um, they, the, the British purpose, purposefully got the Chinese people addicted to opium. So, uh, that was um, massively cut down on by Mao. Uh, there were policies to combat that. And, and obviously, you know, that shows the kind of Leninist character, the anti-imperialist character of the revolution, right? The, the idea that we are going to be free from foreign domination, you know, including the domination of, of uh, British capitalist imperialist countries, purposefully getting our people addicted to opium, right? We don't want these drugs. Um, we want to be a strong country who, who, who builds ourselves up and an independent country who is free from domination by Western countries. Um, so they just say, you know, Mao cut down on opium there, uh, totally ignoring the fact that it was Western countries who brought opium to China and who used it as a tool of domination and exploitation. In education, he greatly improved health care and women's rights. It's said because of Mao's policies, life expectancy improved quite quickly in the country. He was a champion of the rural classes, but things would take a turn for the worse. Although he had thought he had done so much. People with ADHD. They're going, I imagine they're going to say um, everything was going good until the Great Leap Forward. Because, like, like, they're being a little bit honest here. Like, you know, you can't, you can't just completely lie about what happened. Right, they're talking here about how he redistributed land and increased life expectancy, but um, now they're going to go off and say that you know while he was increasing life expectancy, 10, 15 years, um, he was also uh, purposefully starving people. I imagine that's what they're going to say. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe they won't say purposefully starving people, but it's not like Mao starved people. They had a famine and stuff, and you know the it it happened during the collectivization effort. So like yeah, the collectivization was a part of it. It's a part of the the deaths under famine that you have to analyze. Um, but it's not like he was purposefully starving people. Like he was like, oh, I wonder how many people I can get rid of. You know, the the goal was to redistribute the land and provide for people to increase productive output so people wouldn't starve. Uh oh. Oh, I forgot to unmute it. All right, here we go the worse. Although he had thought he had done so much good, and he had in many respects, he was still heavily criticized by those he said were on the right. Those were mostly urban folk with urban educations. We might remember many of these people were bullied, hurt, and had their lives turned upside down. And after some amount of condemnation, he embarked on a campaign of fear. His dad No, he didn't. There was debate within the party the whole time. And it, it there was uh, there was conflict between the, the urban population, because what was happening was the agricultural surplus was being used to build up the factories and build up the the industry um, but they had like no uh no ability to produce steel so they they gave the peasants these backyard furnaces which have become famous in the west they'll probably talk about them at some point and they had to train um train the the agricultural population up in the production of steel so then all of the surplus from from the agricultural population was being used to build up the cities so then the debate within the party which you know they call right wing which was you know yes it was a more sort of uh, uh right wing more liberal uh section of the party said we should continue to to build communism but open ourselves up to market reforms and and uh do different things to help the development in our cities and that is what Deng Xiaoping would do after Mao right uh, Mao tried to use the agricultural surplus to develop the cities he did in many ways but there were many issues with it uh, which were debated in the party which were critiqued by Mao himself um, and then Deng Xiaoping opened up the cities uh, to specific financial zones where uh, foreign financing and foreign capital can flow in and, and help build up those city areas. But uh, 
Of course, we can't talk about things as a historical development. We can't talk about the debate that was going on within the party. We have to view Mao as a comic book villain who killed everyone who disagreed with him. So here we go. ...had to be silenced, and they were. Mao had even allowed people to voice their concerns about how the country should be run, which came under the banner, Hundred Flowers Campaign. But many of those on the right expressing concern of the leadership were just sent to prison. If you think being doxxed is bad, imagine hundreds of thousands being sent to dank jail cells just for sharing an opinion. Some writers say the campaign was only there in the first place to weed out the so-called threats. In many other cases, people were executed, and it's said in every village there were executions. People also perished in labor... There really weren't that many executions, inclu- like... Even the feudal landlords, um, uh, I mean, a lot of them died. There were like 200 of them who got killed, but a lot of them um, weren't even killed. And I have a book that my mom gave me, actually. This was a lady who, she was put in jail for a while, for like two years during the Cultural Revolution, which, you know, I've, I've come out and said I'm against the Cultural Revolution. Like, it was a mistake, but, but either way, you know, um, it's not what it's portrayed as in the West. So this is a book that, that they teach in Western schools about uh, Mao's China, and this woman was uh, uh, working with the British. <laughs> uh, she was accused of being a spy for the British. And in the book, she admits like she had British people coming and visiting her in her house all the time. And even after the revolution, they didn't redistribute all of her land. Um, but her family was a giant uh, oil family. They worked for Shell Oil Company within China. And then they heavily supported the Kuomintang nationalists, obviously, against the communist revolution. But she wasn't even killed. What She was just put in jail for like two years during the Cultural Revolution. Um, for supposedly being a British spy and for being a Shell Oil executive um, uh, and, uh, you know, during a communist revolution. <laughs> so, uh, obviously, you would accept, uh, expect the land to be seized, but it wasn't. Um, she describes in the book how she was living in a mansion compared to the other Chinese civilians, um, uh, even even during the revolution. Um, and not that I agree with her being put in jail, obviously. That's... Um, Obviously, we want to avoid that. That's why I'm against the Cultural Revolution. But that woman died in 2009, right? She lived a long and uh, happy life, uh, eventually moving to Washington, D.C. to talk crap about China and Mao for the rest of her life. So, you know, the, the, the brutality of the Cultural Revolution um, is often exaggerated, even if it's something that we don't agree with. Um, and I know people do agree with the Cultural Revolution because it was an attempt to weed out this, like, bourgeois ideology of people like shell executives um, <laughs> uh, who lived in mansions compared to the, the peasants who were trying to industrialize and, and uh, increase their productive forces. But, you know, in my opinion, uh, all you can do uh, with building communism is, is build the... Um, the material base, right? Change the relations of production, the productive forces, and then allow the culture, you know, to kind of to kind of move along as it will. I, I think it's kind of a, you know, and Che Guevara would disagree with me on this. I think it's kind of a um, a a pointless effort to try and um, manually change the culture of your country by just moving it forward, right? Like to, by toward, moving it towards socialism. That needs to happen, you know, in the process of collectivization and building communes. Like in, uh, in um, uh, Venezuela, which is heavily influenced by Mao, they have, uh, now they're, it's decreasing in number, sadly. Um, but when they first started their revolution, they had like thousands of communes where uh, production um, was decided locally uh, by the communes. And um, that's the kind of stuff that's going to build, uh, you know, which China was doing too, but that's the kind of stuff that's going to build communist uh, or, or change culture, move um cultural values forward not you know throwing oil executives in jail and, and torturing them or whatever um or or uh i don't know so yeah i don't know uh, does anyone does anyone have any good uh any good analysis of the of the cultural revolution or does anyone support it can you react to a yanmi park propaganda video yeah that's a good idea camps, where Mao had hoped to see a reform through labor campaign change people's views. It's also written that during this time, many people took their own lives before they could be forced to... Yeah, that's another thing. Like, a lot of people weren't put in jail. They were exiled to, like, the fields where they had to work. And there were a lot of academics who were sent out there. Um, and again, like, that's the kind of stuff I'm against. Uh, um... But, you know, there were a lot of people like oil executives who had been or like the tyrannical landlords who weren't killed, who were like sent to the fields. And it would be like taking Jeff Bezos, right? Uh, these people, these exploiters who have dominated our country's political and economic system for years um, while exploiting the rest of us. It'd be like if we uh, if workers took the political system in the U.S. and said, Jeff Bezos, you got to go work on a farm like uh, 40 hours a week so we can teach you to be a proletarian like um I don't know. I'm not super against that. I think it would be hilarious and awesome. To work or be executed. Without criticism, there can be no progress. Without a dialectic, it's hard to move. 
someone said, where would Che disagree with you? Che wanted, che wanted to build communism. Um, he, che and Mao were, I don't want to say they're more dedicated to building communism than um, sort of like Deng Xiaoping and the, and the communists of today, but like uh, they were more focused on, on cultural revolution and, and moving their whole society and the consciousness of their society forward. Um, so like uh, Che supported the cultural revolution and, and he thought like the like I was describing how you should just focus on um, the material base and production um, rather than focusing on trying to change cultural values um, versus Che said that no you know the cultural revolution is good we need to move forward because socialism is not just an economic position you know socialism is is the transition into a new society that leads to new culture and new mode of thought um, so yeah a little bit I don't know, just a little bit utopian for me. Like, I don't think uh, states and government should be, like, trying to mess with culture other than, like, uh, through, like, the education system and stuff, right? Like, um, if we were to have a socialist revolution in the U.S. tomorrow, we would want to massively increase uh, public education um, and, and access to public education and funding in public education. Then we would really want to reform the system, right? Like, you would want to teach kids philosophy and, um, and different things that are hidden from the American school system because they don't want us to figure out that we live in, in an exploitative, broken system called capitalism forward and when you glue the mouths of your detractors something bad is likely going to happen it did and worse than anything previously seen in 1958 mao launched his great leap forward which were a series of reforms to push the country forward this included forcing farmers to work in a collective everything was for the country the move ahead the bright future and anyone the collectivization happened well before then and, and they're talking about how this is all for the building of the country the bright future and yes, you know, the foundation that was laid under Mao did lead to China becoming an anti-imperialist power, you know, one of the one of the uh, the greatest or richest producing nations on the country an, an economic superpower who in the coming years is going to challenge the hegemony of the United States and Western capital. Um, so like versus like, what's the American dream, right? So they're talking about how um, how this is bad because things were collectivized and people were working to b make the country strong and they successfully made their country so strong and successfully freed their people from imperialism. Uh, meanwhile, the American dream is, oh, I hope one day I can save enough money so I can become the exploiter rather than the exploited. Right? I can, I can, the American dream is, is starting a business so you can exploit a bunch of people while you play golf all day um, instead of being one of the people who has to work all day and have their labor exploited. That's the American dream. Um, you know, and, and before that, it was like manifest destiny. Like we're going to genocide all these, all these Native Americans so we can um, use slave labor to make ourselves super rich on their land. You know, and, and this is a God told us to do this. We need to take over the whole country and, and, um, uh, and do these things because God said so. Um, and that's the, the American ideology, the American culture that's, that we've, um, that's grown and developed through the years. Uh, but they're critiquing China, you know, for, for wanting to make their whole country strong, for having this collective sort of uh, a dream of building a country free from imperialism and building a country free from things like starvation, um, building a strong, prosperous country for, for the people of China and eventually constructing communism. Um, right, that's authoritarian because Mao implemented that on people in his collectivization efforts. Um, but of course, manifest destiny and, and the American dream, those aren't uh, manipulative ideas um, to, to get people to think a certain way or to get people to think uh, through a certain lens. Um, they only have that in China. Here in the U.S., we're all just free thinking and nobody wants to control your brain at all working for themselves in the vein of an individual capitalist was severely punished. The reforms were many, but a big emphasis was also on quickly industrializing the country, which often involved taking the peasants out of the fields and into iron and steel production. China was then hit by devastating floods and some bad harvests, and all the efforts to have people working in industries did not really work out. The movement from field to factory also meant lower grain production. Mao's propaganda would tell a different story, however. When you have zero tolerance, criticism, or even complaining, it's not always the police or army that get to you. It's your neighbor, because much of the time, they're playing a bad part in the prisoner's dilemma game, which basically means they get you before you can get to them. One writer for The Guardian interviewing a Chinese author wrote, across China, teachers, former... Look at these guys in their suits. It's like, <laughs> these are the people we're trusting about China. Even even the animation uh, says, here are the Western academics that we're, we're going to talk about when it comes to China. It looks like they're in a mansion wearing suits. <laughs> like... <laughs>
<laughs> how about you ask the peasants what they thought of it? Right? How about you ask the people who were starving and oppressed by landlords before who then moved to uh, collectivization efforts? And, and, you know, a lot of the things they said were true. There were uh, troubles in, in, you know, building up their industry. It was really, really hard to, to industrialize their country, to move from a country that was semi-feudal, a country that had no industry or nobody who even knew how to work with uh, steel um, or do things like steel production, and that had to be built from the ground up. Yes, there were a ton of problems with it, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't like Mao purposefully starving people. It was Mao trying to do his best, and this idea that he didn't allow criticism is so ridiculous if you've read anything about the debate that was going on within the party at this time. There was so much criticism, including Mao of himself, and, and this is something that goes on till today. Like, this is how you can tell these like shows like infographics are, are um, you know, I don't know who they're funded by or whatever, but they don't read any sources from like within China. Because if you read Xi Jinping's book, like half this book is him critiquing himself and China's economic policy. And if you read Mao, it's very similar. So like that's not to defend everything they did. Obviously, I have critiques of the things they did. They have critiques of themselves. But like to to act like they just murder everybody who critiques them um, is is absolutely insane and ahistorical. And it shows that whoever you know is writing these videos is has no interest in what uh, the people of China are saying about their own system. Right? It's all Western academics in their suits sitting in mansions discussing how evil Mao was because he took uh, the the land of those who were living in luxury and redistributed it uh, to the working class people. I wonder why these wealthy Western academics would have problems with policies of redistribution. <laughs> Landlords and intellectuals were being humiliated, beaten, and murdered. They were hounded by neighbors, colleagues, and pupils, moved by misguided revolutionary fervor, personal grudges, or a little more than whim. Friends, children, and spouses turned on them. We might also say that during rules of cults of personality, people can become quite drunk with love, stoned on their belief that they know the true path cut by the great leader. So when ruin comes, there just wasn't anywhere the people could turn. Many of those that did criticize the policies were called right opportunists and imprisoned. It was a chaotic time, to say the least. What happened? There were, um... There were like, uh, I don't know, I think a lot of Maoists today seem to be like ultras. And, you know, there, there are people who will argue that like if you actually were a Maoist, um, this is the difference between like uh, Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, and like Mao Zedong thought. So like people who like Mao's thought, um, I think, you know, it, from my uh, point of view, and I, you know, uh, Maoists are are still comrades and stuff, of course, but I think Maoists today are like ultras, right, who don't look at the development of China. They just look at Mao's, like, cultural revolution and, and his attempt to, like, speed uh, society towards communism, um, and, and they like that more than Deng Xiaoping's liberalization and market reforms, which, you know, have allowed massive uh, poverty alleviation, but have also, you know, allowed China to become somewhat liberalized uh, as compared to the times under Mao. Um, but, and, and, you know, at the time, you know, there was that debate going on within the party between the, the more right wingers, uh, like Deng Xiaoping who wanted, you know, more, uh, more market exchange, uh, versus the ones who wanted more top down planning, more, more centralized control by the state. But, you know, the, the centralized control by the state and, and the policies and the collectivization and industrialization that happened under Mao allowed for the policies of Deng and the market reforms and opening up, right? If Deng Xiaoping would have opened up the country to market reforms, uh, uh, without, you know, Mao first laying the industrial base and, and collectivizing agriculture and doing all these things, it wouldn't have even made any sense, right? It, it, it's impossible to think about because uh, the market reforms and, and the allowing of certain financial zones in China um, was, was built, uh, those plans were created based on the base that had been built under Mao. Um, so yeah, there was this constant debate in the party going on. And, and I'm, you know, it's weird because I like, I almost agree with the video here. Like, I do think Maoists uh, have had a tendency to be super ultra um, and and not um, put they put uh, um, like ideology ahead of material reality at times. Uh, so yeah, it was a famine. Not really Mao himself though. Like the policies of Mao. Um, you know, I I don't know if if Deng Xiaoping was right. You know, and the and more market exchange and more liberalization would have been better. You know, I, I, I can't say that. And, and it's hard to find data from that time. Like even this video was saying, you know, the, the estimated deaths and exact statistics on China weren't available at this time uh, because they weren't like a technically advanced country. Right. They were a semi feudal like colonized nation who was building themselves up. Um, so there's not like exact statistics. There aren't a bunch of like uh, 
Um, there weren't a bunch of universities to, to do studies about uh, socioeconomic conditions the same way we have in like the U.S. or Western world today, or even, you know, in, in China today in the East. A terrible famine. This was a response from one party official who had been told there was no food for people to eat. They're dying. That's right, deviationist thinking. You're viewing the problem in an overly simplistic manner. This famine literally killed off entire villages, decimated towns, turned some people on each other. Farmers declaring that their harvest was terrible were sometimes beaten, set alight, drowned. The Guardian writes, others are tortured, beaten, or buried alive for declaring realistic harvests, refusing to hand over what little food they have, stealing scraps, or simply angering officials. One Chinese man called Yang Jixing, who lived through these harsh times, many years later wrote a book called tombstone which he penned after tra and over the whole they're they're gonna go to another biography of someone living in china it was it's so funny when you look these up i don't know who this person is we can look him up after this but like when i looked up this lady who my mom gave me you know which is a biography about someone um in china uh during the time of mao it's like she was an oil executive who worked for shell oil and like sided with the right-wing kuomintang nationalists so it's like you know, it's hard for me, like, to feel that bad about this person. You know, in America, obviously, being a Shell Oil executive is considered as, like, making it. Like, that's successful. Like, you're a good person. But as a communist, it's like, Mao, you know, Mao was really mean to these oil executives. He redistributed their land. It's like, oh, no. Like, <laughs> oh, how sad. I don't know about this guy, though. Traveling the length and breadth of China to find out how people had been affected by the famine. His own father had died of starvation back then. He finds case upon case of acts of sheer desperation and depravity. In one such case, 13 kids appeal to the officials to give them a scrap of food. The officials take the young kids to the edge of the mountains, where they die of exposure. In another case, a young boy kills and eats his own brother. He mentions other cases where... Again. Again, proving Stalin's point that one death is a tragedy and it can be used to pitch any narrative, you know, but a million deaths is a statistic. They're not talking about the statistics at this time. They've actually done okay in talking about, you know, some of the actual policies that were going on under Mao. Uh, it's hard to talk, you know, they, they're sticking to this dogmatic idea that Mao allowed no criticism of himself, which is like forcing them then leading them to like uh uh misrepresent a lot of what was going on because the debate that was going on within the party is hugely important to, to understanding what they were trying to do but you know why would we talk about that when we can talk about six minutes of anecdotal evidence about kids eating each other where people didn't bury their deceased family members. They hid them so that they could collect their food rations. In some cases, people just ate their dead friends and family. Like the historian we mentioned. Oh, they all started eating each other. The Chinese writer got this information from Chinese provincial archives. The authorities at least were good at keeping records. To start with, I felt terribly depressed when I was reading these documents, he told the Guardian. But after a while, I became numb, because otherwise I couldn't carry on. His book is banned in China, and some critics wonder if the Chinese authorities have not learned a lesson already about censorship. Is history doomed to repeat itself? We doubt it. But Maybe it's banned because it's wrong. <laughs> let's, let's, uh, let's look up this author. Tombstone, the Chinese famine. Who is this by? Yang? Yang Jincheng. Let's see if this guy has a similar background to Nian Cheng, the, the person my mom gave me. Um, Cultural Revolution. He was part of the Communist Party. Joined uh, this news agency where he worked till his retirement. Um... Uh, his loyalty to the party was destroyed in the Tiananmen Square massacre. Interesting. Uh, it looked like he just worked for a regular Chinese news agency here. I don't know anything about this news agency. Um, it says it was founded by the, the Communist Party, but... Um, in, the, in the 90s, Yang began interviewing people and collecting records of the Great Chinese Famine. Um, so that happened, so he started going after the, uh, the famine that happened in the 1960s after the Tiananmen Square massacre, um, you know, massacre in the, in 1989. I'm not sure why he wasn't investigating it before that, but, um, uh, P's father died of hunger. That's actually sad. Yeah, this person seems more legit than, um, Nian Cheng, the book that my mom gave me, <laughs> um, but. It, uh, yeah, I'm not going to be able to debunk this book. I've never read. Um, and maybe the book has good stuff in it. Like I said, uh, you could extrapolate um, data or you could just tell narratives of individual stories of people dying from hunger. And there were obviously horrible deaths uh, from hunger that were going on and stuff. Um, 
because they were trying to collectivize and industrialize their country after they were being after being a backwards uh, semi feudal uh, colonized nation. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I don't have anything specific to say about that book. But one might ask, even as right and left schisms destroy friends' as alliances, if banning and blocking is a good thing. Yang called the banning of his book an offense to the memories of tens of millions. Of course, we can't directly charge Chairman Mao for all the deaths, and it's said that some of the Communist Party leaders kept a lot of information away from him regarding the death of the famine. But we must also make him a- That's the other thing, I'm, and I'm glad they actually point that out, but it's like, the country at the time had close to a billion people, and now they have 1.4 billion people. It's like- if, you know, these these uh, stories of the authorities being uh, uh, torturing people or killing people and stuff are true, they're horrible. You know, that's bad. Um, uh, local authorities shouldn't do that. Um, but like we said previously, uh, those those peasant um, villages, those places the, or those peasant, uh, the peasantry was ruled by these um, uh, tyrannical feudal landlords. And then, you know, you can't just like place all the blame for that on Mao. Like obviously, you know, in any country, in any economic system, whether socialist or not, you're going to have like repression from the government or people in power against people who aren't in power. Um, but that right, it's it's a giant party. Like today, the Communist Party of China is 100 million people. Um, and those are people who are like active, active in the villages. Um, and at this time, uh, the, the local authorities were tasked with making sure that the economic plans were carried out. Um, and they were tasked with uh, um, making sure the people's needs were met um, and, and basically uh, making sure that these peasant alliances um, uh, were getting enough food via mutual aid groups and stuff. And that was the, the central authority they were getting from Mao. And that doesn't mean that in this country of you know a billion people that there weren't acts of repression and that there weren't horrible things that happened in individual villages. Um, but you can't just centralize that and say, this is the fault of communism and this is the fault of Mao. Like you could go through every state um, in the US and you could describe like cops killing people or you could extrapolate you know horrible stories or or, or kids who grew up on the streets and, and never had anything. Um, and uh, you could blame all that on, on the, you know, the president. You could say, this is all Joe Biden's fault, right? It wouldn't really be true, <laughs> um, but you could do it, right? Um, it doesn't mean you're not addressing a real problem. It doesn't mean there was, there's not a real problem with like police repression and police violence in this country. It doesn't mean China didn't have a problem with certain authorities being authoritarian and cracking down on people. But it's not like this is the fault of communism. This is the fault of Mao. It's just the fault of like human society, right? And the realities of, of any kind of human society accountable for his part, his rule by fear, his intolerance for criticism. While one man alone we cannot blame, it perhaps is just easier to focus ire on one thing, one face. But that man, that face, did say things. To read too many books is harmful. When did he say that? Because one of my favorite quotes from Lenin um, is, or one of my favorite stories is, it, Marx was asked, would you rather have a wife or a mistress? And, you know, Marx was more of a family man, and he said, I, I would have a wife. And then Ingalls was asked the same thing. Would you have a, rather have a wife or a mistress? And Ingalls kind of liked to party. Uh, and Ingalls said, I'd rather have a mistress. And then Lenin was asked the same thing. And Lenin said both. I would have a wife and a mistress so they can hang out uh, while I find a solitary place to read, read, read. <laughs> that was what he suggested to everyone. A little bit sexist, honestly. Lenin should have said, I'll invite my wife and my mistress to read, read, read with me. Um, but he, at the time, Lenin was actively telling people even to read right-wingers, right? Even to read, like, the most disgusting, ideologically heinous people at the time, like these racist anti-Semites, so that you know how to respond to them, right? That was the situation in the USSR. So I, I, I'm sure this quote is taken out of context. I cannot imagine Mao said reading too many books is bad. And then political power grows out of the barrel of the gun. That's just true, right? Like if, like we were saying earlier, there were tyrannical feudal landlords, right? They weren't just going to give over the land to the peasants. The peasants had to seize that land um, in a revolution. And revolutions are things that happen historically in every country, right? When you have, when the exploited um, finally, uh, finally uh, take up arms and, and, and um, use authority, take authority, take power um, from the exploiters. Like, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. He also said, to read too many books is harmful. This was in his famous Little Red Book, which consists of 427 quotations from Mao. It said a billion copies. Yeah, baby. Great book. <laughs> It, it is a good book. It's specific to China. Like, this is, a, I mean, reading this book, actually, like, ignoring what they're talking about in the video right now, like, uh, 
there there's of course good stuff in it right which is why i say like Mao Zedong thought um is uh is is what i follow not i'm not a marxist leninist maoist and i think that's a little bit dogmatic like there's stuff in here like the the protracted people's war um and leadership of party committees like um that's specific to china right like there's there's stuff like democracy in three main fields oops there's like different things that mao added that could be like universally applicable and there's tons of stuff to learn from him but it's not like um it's not like uh like everything Mao wrote is applicable in, in uh, the modern era, in modern China, or in uh, the modern United States, of course. Um, it's, it was specifically about China and, and the historical context of China at the time. Not saying you shouldn't read it. It's still great to read, great to learn from. And it's actually one of the best things to, to learn and, and read from because he was actually trying to construct socialism, right? He wasn't, um, he wasn't just an academic writing in his ivory tower, right? He was writing about uh, what they were doing in practice and how well it worked. Um, but yeah, it's not something like, like we should run around uh, the United States today and with Mao's little red book and be like, hey, everyone, we need to follow Chairman Mao. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah. Copies of this book have been published, making it more widespread than the whole of the Harry Potter series of books, but still a little way behind the Bible. Still, in some countries today, leaders look upon their population as a herd of sheep designed for their sometimes unruly demands and absolute theories, mostly indirectly related to them retaining their power. As Sir Francis Bacon once said, knowledge is power, and maybe we should all arm ourselves with a foundation of knowledge, a willingness to listen and change, to not fall for a despot's lies, to not be seduced by groupthink, to not be... <laughs> That's so funny that they say that because, you know, of course it wasn't groupthink. There was this great debate that was going on in the party. And then, you know, after Mao, they, they totally changed their system. They totally adapted um, to the, the global economic and financial systems like the IMF and the World Bank that were dominated by Western capitalists um, and the ability of Western capitalists to control financing and the, the ability of the U.S. to put countries under economic warfare. China did adapt to that. And, and in the 70s, you know, uh, Deng Xiaoping went ahead with the market reforms, which are hugely controversial among communists but absolutely we're adapting to the the material conditions right there's no argument about that being what it was an attempt to do and it was very different from the policies of Mao right they went in a very different direction um uh and the different direction they went in was based on what had been done under Mao so it wasn't just this dogmatic idea like Deng Xiaoping had argued for uh uh, more market exchange and a more uh, policies more similar to Lenin in 1949 when the party you know first took power, but the policies that he proposed in 1972 were much different from the policies he was proposing in 1949 because as things developed and changed, the ideas also had to develop and change with them. So it's the opposite of what they're saying here. The the party has been extremely flexible, um, which you know is part of what gets them a lot of criticism from Maoists and from uh, uh, from Western leftists. Be enthralled too much by the madness of the crowd and live with open hearts and curious minds. What do you think of Mao Zedong? Could the fan All right, someone says, um, yeah, the very work they're mis misappropriating as don't read books from is about critically thinking about what you read. Right, so you can't just read books and, and assume that everything you're reading is true. <laughs> All right, like especially like Lenin was talking about how he was reading the the group of anti-Semites in the USSR so he could know what they're talking about, right? He's not saying read them because they're smart and, and read them and adopt their ideology. He's like saying read them to know what they're saying, know how to combat their heinous ideas um, and know how to uh, pitch Marxism as a uh, better ideology. But um, yeah, and I just read this, The New Class War by Michael Lind, like he says stuff in this book like uh, systemic racism no longer exists in the United States, which is like, of course, I disagree with that. But, you know, a lot of the, the rest of the book has really good class analysis of like the American um, agricultural regions, the rural regions versus the city regions, uh, the conflict between the two. Um, it's a really good analysis of um, uh, outsourcing of manufacturing jobs and, and uh, what's been going on in the labor market since Ronald Reagan and, and the era of neoliberalism. And he's not a Marxist, right? He talks shit about Marx in this book, too. But, like, doesn't mean there's not good information in it. Um, so, yeah, so Mao telling people to read critically um, is what we take in the West and say, you know, Mao told people not to read, which I don't know. <laughs> I'm not surprised. And, you know, that's that's part of, you know, U.S. imperialism and, and part of the, the culture of imperialism is we do we see all these countries as like not as smart as us. Right. Like, oh, um, uh, they they just fell for despotism. The, the Chinese people fell for this dictatorial leader. 
Um, and, and they fell for it when he said, you shouldn't read too many books. You should only read me. When in reality, you know, that leader was telling people, read everything, uh, read even people you disagree with, just read them critically. Don't just expect, or don't just, um, you know, accept everything you read as true, which is a huge problem today with Western media. And, you know, the, the fact that we're bombarded by information all the time in the, in the age of information, uh, that's really good advice for Mao. But of course the West, the West can't portray it like that. Um, they have to portray it as Mao telling his people not to read. <laughs> um, so, so now let's watch this Vijay Prashad video about China so we can cleanse our palate um, from that horrible infographics video. Uh, but first I'll answer some questions or, or talk to the chat a little bit if anyone has something to say. Uh, new video, Cold War from Soviet POV. Ooh, that looks cool. We'll pull that up. Friends would, would walk up coffee. to me and just be like, what oh, the you guys f in your yeah, mug? And I would just tell them, please no. This video is historically accurate, just biased. <laughs> that's cool. Orientalism. Yes, that's the word. Thank you. Yes. Um, that is what it is, Orientalism. And, you know, you see it with, you saw it with the war on terror and stuff, too. Like, uh, part of, part of uh, imperialism is always racism. And it's always, you know, ori or Orientalism or... Um, or we need to fight the war on terror, you know, because uh, people in Afghanistan or people in the Middle East or people in the Arab world, uh, they're just jihadists, right? They just hate America irrationally. Um, so therefore, we have to invade their countries and fight terror. Um, and, and that led to a massive spike um, in hate crimes against Muslims in the U.S. throughout uh, the entire last two decades. And then now we're seeing the same thing with China, a spike in um, anti-Asian hate crimes happening in the U.S. Uh, because the culture of imperialism, the culture that forms around imperialism is one of domination, uh, one of hatred, and one of like, uh, we are better than you, uh, regardless of, you know, even though that's definitely not true in, in almost every field, China is kicking the U.S.'s ass. <laughs> That's a great video, LOL. Yeah, I'm pumped to watch that. Uh, we'll probably watch it here. Love when Westerners and Western leftists can't get past Orientalism. Yeah, Kyle Kalinske had a tweet the other day. It was like, um, what was it? It was something like they were going to teach like evangelical religion in like Texas schools or something. I don't know. It was something, you know, some absurd law. And then uh, Kyle Kalinske quote tweeted and said, like, what are we, North Korea? And then somebody quote tweeted him and said, uh, sees an American person doing something very American. What are we, a bunch of Asians? Like, that's literally what it is. Like, uh, we have to, um, when we see something authoritarian and, um, or, or something where evangelical religion is making its way into the school system, um, when we're supposedly a secular country, it's not, oh, wow, you know, classic America. Americans are like, oh, we're like North Korea. 